This is a 1998 talk by John Rappaport, just prior to the release of his book, The Secret Behind Secret Societies. John discusses his groundbreaking research and exciting prospects for the future. Here is Mr. John Rappaport. It's great to be here to be talking about something that took me 30 years to put together. That's a long time. When you spend 30 years writing a book, and of course, you don't always think that you're writing a book during that whole 30 years, your mind moves into many, many different places. You think of many different things. And in fact, you collide with yourself at various times, and that's what happened to me. I'm going to try to boil down three or four hours of conversation here into 45 minutes and describe something about my new book, The Secret Behind Secret Societies, subtitled Liberation of the Planet in the 21st Century. I started off as a painter in 1961 in New York. I was so entranced by the idea of painting on canvas that I had to do it despite the fact that I had no background, no training. And as far as anybody could tell, uh, in elementary school, I was always the worst, the person who couldn't draw the face. But something grabbed me. I went and saw some artists' studios, some friends of mine in New York. They painted large. And uh, I became overnight addicted, what can I say? I became a painter. And I didn't really care that I didn't have the schooling. I was living in New York City. I went to the Metropolitan Museum, the modern art every day. I looked at work from medieval painting, the Impressionist period, the post-Impressionist period, modern art, wandered through the halls of the Egyptian and Assyrian statuary. That's how I educated myself after I had already graduated from college as a major in philosophy. And I basically painted for 15 or 20 years, let's call it exactly 21 years, before I seriously began to write as an investigative reporter. And during those 20 years as a painter, I came to understand in my bones what the idea of creating, imagining, inventing meant. It meant, basically, having a new lease on life every morning when you woke up. But there were a lot of pieces to my particular puzzle that, in 1961, were not filled in. Far from it. I just knew that I had a tremendous desire to paint, to be an artist. And when I looked at my own work, my imagination ran riot as to what it meant, because it was mainly abstract. In 1982, I began working as an investigative reporter. I had been writing poetry and had gotten published as a poet, and I was interested in the imagination. I had been doing research, you might say, as a painter on the imagination for 20 years. But it had gone beyond just being a painter. Something inside me said, the creative faculty, the power to invent and imagine on this planet has somehow been undermined because each one of us has that capacity to a much greater degree than we think is possible, way beyond what we conceive is our actual power. And I sensed as a painter that when we talk about the imagination or invention or creation, we're not talking about something on the periphery of our lives. We're talking about something in the core of our being, the central part of our being. If you don't think you have an imagination, pretend you do. It's a very fascinating faculty, this ability to imagine, because at any moment you can restore it 
by simply pretending that it's there because that's part of imagination. I began writing articles for the LA Weekly in 1982. I happened to know somebody who was interested in the nuclear issue, was an expert. I had a friend working on the LA Weekly newspaper and she said they were looking for an article about that and I said, well, I can do that. And I interviewed this man and I got a check in the mail and they put the story on the cover. I said, well, that's pretty easy. I can support myself as a painter. I had had one or two shows, but I really wasn't making a lot of money. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write articles. And I began writing on a regular basis for the LA Weekly. Something happened. Something that it's, you'd want an hour, two hours, three hours to describe the personal drama of it. But basically, over a period of 10 years, I discovered that the world was rigged. To say I was naive before then would not really be true because I, I wasn't naive, but I didn't understand the details. I began writing articles about the medical cartel, the pharmaceutical cartel, the cluster of agencies and societies and corporations that made up our current modern medical system, the physicians, the Food and Drug Administration, the pharmaceutical companies, the upper echelons of the medical societies, including the World Health Organization. And I began to discover that there was a commonality of interest among these people and that health was not at the top of their list. Profits, ego, prestige, control, this seemed to be more along the lines of their agenda. The medical cartel was not the only monopoly that I ran into, not by a long shot. There was the monopoly of information, the media, the monopoly of intelligence, the CIA, the weapons monopoly, the arms manufacturers, and so on and so forth. And this handful of monopolies together composed a transnational structure of corporations and governments and storefront operations, you might say, for the governments and the corporations that led to a massive agenda, an evolving agenda, of world control. This was quite disturbing to see it in its details. And I'm going to give you some of these details just so you can get a flavor of what it might be like to discover this for yourself from scratch. Let's go to the medical cartel because I've been very active over the years as both a journalist and an advocate and ran for Congress in Los Angeles and 29th District in 1994. On the basis of each citizen should have the right to choose alternative health treatments of their own liking for themselves, should not be able to be coerced by any government idea of what health and medical treatment actually consists of. And the government for a long, long time in this country has been threatening on that front and has taken away the rights of citizens to choose. So when I began to investigate this, here are a few factoids that I came across. These are factoids that are verifiable. Number one, in the United States over the last 35 years, from one class of psychiatric drug called neuroleptics, 20 drugs, we have developed in the United States between 300,000 and a million cases of motor brain damage called tardive dyskinesia. Number two, the AIDS drug, AZT, taken by perhaps two to 300,000 people worldwide, creates the basic symptoms of AIDS, kills and maims many, 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 many people. It acts in the following way. When a cell is reproducing, and I mean any cell in the body, 
AZT mimics a certain action in the DNA reproductive cycle so that the cell is fooled into thinking that it's reproducing and actually it's self-destructing. It acts, in other words, this drug as a chemotherapy. And many, many people have died from it. Factoid 3. And this is written about in a very interesting book called The Chemotherapy of Advanced Epithelial Cancer, written in Germany by a man named Ulrich Abel, who had impeccable credentials as a biostatistician numbers cruncher for cutting edge cancer studies carried on in Germany. He took a year off and he researched the entire literature about chemotherapy and concluded the following astounding thing. For 70 to 80 percent of the cancers that kill people, chemotherapy is both completely ineffective and does not improve the quality of life. In fact, it is terribly, terribly toxic. Factoid 4. Every year in the United States, from a class of drugs which can be obtained over the counter called NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, taken for arthritis, 70 to 80,000 people are hospitalized, and of those, Seven to 8,000 die every year in the United States. Factoid five. In 1993, on Nightline, Ted Koppel and several doctors were discussing the Hillary Health Plan, which was in the process of being put together at that time. At the end of the show, Ted said, well, We've seen there are a lot of problems with getting any kind of health program for the American public. Does anybody have anything to say? And an OBGYN MD, friend of Ted's named Herb Kaiser, piped up, yes, Ted, as a matter of fact, one of the things we really have to think about is that no matter what kind of health plan we have for America, we have to solve certain medical problems such as Every year in the United States, there are 10 million unnecessary surgeries from which 50 to 60,000 people a year die. <laughs> Excuse me? Let me repeat that again. Every year in the United States, between 10 and 15 unnecessary million unnecessary surgeries from which 50 to 60,000 people die. That's more people every year dying than all the Americans that died in the Vietnam War. And Ted says, his mind racing behind his mouth, well, Herb, I mean, if that's true, I mean, if, if that's true, Herb, then, I mean, that's astounding. Ten to... 10 to 15 million unnecessary surgeries a year, Ted. The show was just kind of stopped, you might say. Freeze, pause, stop. Well, let's go on, and they carried on the conversation. It was too staggering to believe. Now, try to imagine that you as a reporter, in this case, I, being an investigative journalist, I've been writing articles now for several years for newspapers and magazines around the country. This is in the 80s. Was nominated for a Pulitzer by the LA Weekly for coverage of the military takeover at the University of Salvador. And I happened to come upon this thing called the medical cartel. And gradually, I begin to uncover these factoids and many others as well. I can't tell you how many toxic drugs I discovered and began to flesh out in terms of how many Americans they affect. But just from the five facts that I've given you today, ask yourself the question, how would that make me feel to be the possessor of that information and not know who to tell it to, not know who would publish it, and then to begin to think, how many Americans does that actually affect? 
these five factoids, how many Americans are we actually talking about that are affected by these things in a very, very, very adverse and contrary way every year? We are talking about almost everybody, if you include the families who are in terrible turmoil from the people, the Americans, who are affected with what has sometimes been called iatrogenesis, meaning illness caused by doctors and medicine. Now, what the hell does this have to do with secret societies? Well, the medical system, as it turns out, is a secret society. That's right. It's a cult. It's a secret society. When we strip away the sputtering candles and the darkness and the costumes and the rites and rituals, the true definition of a secret society or a cult is simply any group that has as its agenda the control and domination and injury of other people. Now, that secret society can put on an excellent face and does and does good work in one area or two areas and does as for example in crisis emergency trauma medicine absolutely brilliant work that makes the whole deception even more complete because the maiming and the the death the destruction of lives is not noticed and if it's noticed, it's not believed. So let's get that straight, first of all. The definition of a secret society is any group which has as its agenda, private, away from the public eye, the maiming, the domination, the control of other people. That's what that is all about. And as I began to wend my way as a reporter through various Yes, secret societies, such as research on modern-day Nazism, research on modern-day Soviet Union in the 80s, research on the CIA, research on the medical cartel, research on the Vatican, to name just a few, what I began to realize was that I was dealing basically with monopolies which were secret societies by the true core crystallized definition of secret society. And I began to delve into this very deeply as a reporter and began to publish extensively on this. Wrote a book in 1988 called AIDS Inc. Scandal of the Century which was an examination of fraudulent medical research at the origin of what was called AIDS research that was carried on at the National Institutes of Health, the largest uh, medical research facility in the world in Maryland. Okay. There I was painting. And I was aware as I continued to paint over the years that this thing called the imagination, the inventive faculty, the creative ability of me and you and everybody else had been much maligned and undermined and put off to the side as in, it's just your imagination. He's just imagining things. And I began to have experiences and had been having experiences for 20 or 30 years by this point that were absolutely mind-boggling that came directly out of my painting. The experiences I'm talking about are altered states of consciousness where in the twinkling of an eye, literally, I went from being my normal self to being someone who was moment to moment completely ecstatic about existence. Not only ecstatic, but without those kinds of radio stations that tend to play in the mind, without a trace of longing for the past, without a trace of guilt over nameless who knows what, without a trace of anything except a huge aliveness, a huge aliveness toward the world in the moment with tremendously clear visual perception of the world, went from being 2080 nearsighted to 2020 at least. 
the emotional level was absolutely exhilarating and marvelous. And these experiences would well up periodically and last for various periods of time from the painting that I was doing in my studio and from looking at the paintings that I was doing and from imagining what the meaning of these abstract paintings was. So by the very act of creating a painting, a world, a space, a universe, take your choice however you want to describe it, and from filling it with the energy that I was as a painter, my life was completely transformed, non-stop. No little local stops along the line. My relationships with people improved overnight. My connection to the world and my certainty about who I was and what I was and my capacity to move forward as a reporter was even based on a certain kind of confidence, tremendous confidence that arose out of painting, the creative act. And I could describe a number of other mind-boggling experiences. I was lying in bed one night, 1990, and suddenly I was involved in doing some techniques of creative imagination visualizing that I had developed and was researching over a 20-year period while I was painting. And while doing one of these exercises, I suddenly felt like absolute silk is the only way I can describe it. A relaxation came over my emotions, my body, my soul that was unparalleled in my life, especially the suddenness of it. And I knew that if wisdom was the name of the game, and it really wasn't, that I could produce wisdom from here to the moon like little toys taken out of my pocket and offered to people. There was a sense of transcendence of the ordinary while being firmly rooted in it. And what a marvelous sense and sensation that was. All right. So let's flash to, say, 1994-95 the collision that took place between me and myself at that time was here I am on the one hand being an investigative reporter digging very deeply into these secret societies, these monopolies and understanding how they function and their agendas and being very certain that I wanted to do something to change this situation in the world, not just simply write about it, but do more than write about it to change that situation. And I was getting out in the public and I was getting ready to run for Congress and all of that on the one hand. And on the other hand, talk about left brain, right brain, here I was as a painter putting up these works of imagination that were totally transforming my life. And I felt I was only just dipping into this research that I was beginning to do on Tibetan tantric mysticism, for example, was so parallel to my own experiences as a painter that I was absolutely boggled. And these people seemed to have a line on the power of the imagination that extended to the capacity to actually materialize objects. That seemed to be a doable, reachable goal of the creative imagination. That among adepts, you might say, there was the capacity to actually create objects where there were none before or disappear ones that were already there among some adepts. Not only that, but I began to research paranormal experimental literature, 50 years of well-designed, contrary to what we've been told, laboratory experiments in various fields of the paranormal 
telepathy, remote perception, the influence of mind over matter. And what I was learning was that this was good literature and good scientific literature and that what it was revealing was these abilities were real in people. Over the long haul of thousands of studies done by good researchers at different universities and institutes. And after all, the paranormal was simply a subcategory of the creative imagination. So I came to a collision with myself. These two tremendous energetic activities, and did they meet? Could they meet? How are they going to come together? The investigative reporter, the painter, the left brain, the right brain. What the hell did it mean? And it gave me pause for thought. And then gradually, over a six-month period, the whole thing fell into place. In the study of Nazism. Without going into the details of the Nazis' relation to the occult and how the Nazis really were a cult and a secret society, I'll put it to you this way. The Nazis and every other secret society and cult, by my definition, at its core was composed of artists. Oh yeah, big time. Perverse artists whose ambition was to create a universe of art that would seduce individuals in large numbers to want to take up residence in that space, that mural, that painting, that world, that universe, as the most important space, the primary space, the holiest and most sacred of spaces, the ultimate space, the only space. It was art. It was imagination operating. It was not simply hideous, oppressive power. In many cases, it was that also. And of course, I'm not trying to minimize or minimize the, the coercion factor. But at the root, it was a lot more than that. At the root, it was art constructed by the imagination of perverse artists who had the agenda of the secret society, which was to control and dominate others. And what better way to control and dominate others than by, and try to wrap your mind around this, the imaginative creation of a wonderful space infiltrated by various energies and entities and patterns that would be extremely attractive to humans and draw them closer and make them want to, as it were, sign on. That was an explosion in my mind, that discovery. Because, of course, we're talking about a two-sided coin here. This has never really been articulated well before. And so I hope that you're tracking with me here. I'm spelling it out lucidly. You see, you have tremendous inner capacity called creative imagination. And that creative imagination can make for you by your using it. It's not some independent thing that just operates on its own. It's you in operation creating makes for you futures that you want, events. It gives you a wider scope of the planet. 
it gives you a sense of being able to contribute to the change of this planet for the better. It operates on the level of personal finance and abundance. It operates on the level of health in being able to up your level of health considerably. It operates in the level of consciousness and the raising of consciousness into realms that we have used words for like enlightenment and uh, salvation if you want to get into a religious uh, mode and so forth. It has just tremendous capacity. Capacity we don't even begin to understand because we as a race, we as a species have bought in to Ticket, 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 ticket. Let me live in your space. Let me live in the space created by the Vatican. Let me live in that heaven populated by many entities. Let me live in a space in which we have marvelous ranks and echelons and hierarchies of power and dominion and authority. Let me live in a space, let's return to Nazi Germany, end of World War I, money in wheelbarrows, unable to buy bread, the humiliation of the German people thinking they were going to conquer Europe, and here they are rooting around in the rubble, and here comes the Nazi regime building on many other little cults and secret societies and painting a marvelous cult mural for the German people, a space, a universe that consisted of the totally bogus scholarship that the German people had in a special elite past that began in the Arctic under caves of ice. Germanic giants, the Teutons, the Aryan race, arose with great third eye psychic powers and great physical strength and sailed out from the Arctic and conquered the world in as far away realms as India, Tibet, the Americas. And it was only these artists, Nazi artists, said by the incautious sexual joining of the Germanic Teutonic, Aryan, pure-blooded race with the lesser races that their powers were lost. And it was the mission of the Nazi party to reestablish this by war, genocide, etc. And this played, as they say, for the German people in the 1930s. This mural played a space had been created. This was not simply the coercion of Adolf Hitler. This was the perverse inspiring through art that seduced the German people into a space called Nazism and all that it implied. And the main thing that it implied, as it turned out, was the giving up of each individual's own creative imagination. The subliminal surrendering of this tremendous capacity to create on one's own. That's what it entailed and that's what happened. Because if you look at Lenny Reifenstahl's film called Triumph of the Will, a perverse masterpiece of its own, which covered the 1934 Nuremberg rally, what do you see? You see a couple of hundred thousand Germans lined up as soldiers, workers with shovels, and children with banners in squared up regiments as far as the eye can see. And on a podium on top of a stage, on top of a platform, on top of elevations, 
artistically constructed by Albert Speer, the master architect of Hitler, there was Hitler and Himmler addressing what? This field of ciphers, of nobodies, of people ready to lay down their lives and die for Hitler. The transition from we will make you into a god, you live in our mural, and we will restore to you the special ability and the marvelous power of the past Germanic race. And once everybody had signed on, what did they get? Robothood. That's what they got. They got no imagination. They got the loss, the burial of their own creative capacities. That's what they got. And that's what they got in the Soviet Union. And that's what the Holy Roman Church imposed on the world in the Middle East at the death of that magician called Jesus. And that's what has been imposed to a degree on the United States by secret societies like the CIA. And with its own minimalist art, that is what is in the process of being imposed upon the planet by a very powerful regime evolving into more and more power called transnational corporations. They are each a secret society. They each rely on artists to create a universe of art, of imagination. And in every case, what they result in doing is burying your imagination. And you sign on. You agree. You allow it to be so. You forget. You find yourself in a position of no longer having the cognizance that you have that kind of creative power. And that this creative power can be applied across the board through life in every sphere, in every way, from here to eternity. And how fantastically thrilling it is when you do apply it. And an operational definition of imagination could be for you the things you don't know you can now do in your current status quo. Whether your status quo is on a scale from 0 to 10 at 0 or 10, it doesn't matter. Imagination is that capacity to create that goes beyond anything that you currently think you can do. That's where imagination takes you. And that's why it is the key, the master key, to the unrolling adventure called life at its greatest height. Let me tell you a little story about psychology just to give you an example of how creation applies here. The world of psychology and psychiatry is basically another secret society. And I don't mean to sound like I'm the kind of person who makes everything into a secret society, because I'm not. But it so happens, and I've researched those fields as part of the medical cartel, it so happens that those fields do a funny thing. They give you a universe of neurosis and sibling rivalry and childhood sexual repressed fantasy and basically say that you are what you are because of your past and only by repairing that can you aspire to something more. That's absolutely false. There's a man named, or was, J. L. Marino, M.D., who founded something called psychodrama, which was basically applying theater to therapy, art, imagination. And I'm not going to try to spell that all out. But he had a patient, a 15, 16-year-old boy, lived in New York, large Italian family, who said that he was Jesus Christ. And the family came to Marino and said, what can we do? And Marino said, look, if you do what I say, you have a chance of succeeding. And what he said was, I want you to play along. 
And they said, what? Play along, exactly. I want you to play along with the idea that your son actually is Jesus Christ by becoming the apostles. <laughs> and they talked about it, and they argued about it, and they finally decided, all right, we'll do it at dinner. Every night we'll be the apostles because the doctor says it might help. And so in a nutshell, here's what happened. Every night, whether it was past the butter or profound discussions about the Bible, it didn't matter. It was all about the boy is Jesus and we're the apostles. And that's the way we'll play it. And they did. After three months, he got tired of it and dropped it. And he was perfectly normal after that. That is, he was just himself. No therapy, no drugs, no remembrance of things past, no anything except the substitution of imagination for ordinary life, the master key. And in this case, because it was applied to a specific situation, it resulted in resolution in a thrilling way. He wanted to be Jesus, and so he was. It was his imagination all the time at the core. After all, regardless of why he did it, he created himself as Jesus, theatrically. And his basic problem was, not that he was neurotic, not that he was psychotic, but he couldn't get anybody to go along with him. That was his problem, do you see? And it was resolved by constructing a theater of the imagination in which he could play it out and he won. That's what happened. And for the last 20 or 30 years what I've been involved in is researching ways that we can bring our imagination, our creative capacity to the fore in every sphere of life to the farthest extent possible not eliminating the possibility that you could look at this glass and make it disappear. And everything in between, from your life as a human being in a family, money, business, economics, politics, health, consciousness, emotional level at which you live life, the excitement of it all, the whole kit and caboodle, that is my work. That's what I do. The purpose of this work is very simply stated, to increase the power and the scope of the imagination. That's what it is. That's what I do. And I construct situations, education, at what I consider the most profound level, techniques and exercises that will increase the power and the scope of your imagination. And coupled with the contextual understanding and background of secret societies and how this planet has been affected by that in the way I've described here today, it's a whole new ball game. And in this 45 minutes, which is about up, I've only had a chance to scratch the surface and to just begin to warm up to the subject to tell you that there are fantastic things in store for us if we'll truly understand what has been happening on this planet for the last 10, 20,000 years. And if we will move to the fore with our own creative imagination to the fullest degree. The book is called The Secret Behind Secret Societies. It's subtitled The Planet, really. Let's just say it's subtitled The Planet because that is what's been going on. Subtitle, Liberation of the Planet in the 21st Century. My name is John Rappaport. I'm investigative reporter. I appreciate your time. This is what we've been talking about today, and there'll be a lot more very soon. And uh, it's been very nice being with you, and I'll see you soon again. Thanks very much. For further information, call Alice Ferguson at 800-321-9054.
Extension 206.